All right, we're on the questions and answers tonight. So, I got two Bibles here <laughs> with my all my notes in it, and I got a Strong's Concordance in case I need to look something up. So the sky's the limit. So what's what's the question, brother? Earl, you said you had a burning question since this morning. So yes, 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 since yesterday, <laughs> that's right. Okay. So go ahead with your question. Um, I've been reading in the book of Matthew, and mm -hmm. uh, I get to uh, twenty-seven fifty-two. Uh, basically, says uh, the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we read the next verse, it's referring to after the, you know it talks about after the resurrection. Right. Uh, but I started reading uh, some Ruckman's notes on that verse, and he said that um, uh, many of those resurrected bodies won't come up until after the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Um, in a post-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could expand on that, but let me just add something first. I was talking to um, somebody a couple weeks ago, uh, and he was convinced that there was a post-tribulation mm -hmm. uh, rapture. Mm -hmm. And he used Matthew 24, 30, 31, which mm -hmm. basically says, they shall gather together his elect mm -hmm. the four winds. And he was thinking mm -hmm. the elect meant the, the, the body of Christ, and I explained this mm -hmm. pretty Israel. Mm -hmm. Um... So I'm wondering if maybe he was partially right, just had this place up there. Is, I mean, I know there's, there's, we've talked a little bit about more than one rapture going on. So is this just the rapture of the Jews? Okay. okay. So let's go back to, everybody get to Matthew 27. Let's look at that real quick. I got an answer for you. Okay. All right. Good. Yep. Um, Matthew 27. Verse 50, And Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now notice the term many there. Not all. Now did you notice that? That's many. Now, these many that arose are connected to something that Paul says. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Saints. That's correct. They are saints, but they died under the law. There's Old Testament saints and there's New Testament saints, brother. These are Old Testament saints. 1 Corinthians what? 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 6. All right, look at that in verse 6 there. After that, he was seen, seen after his resurrection, of above 500 brethren at once. Okay? Above five brethren, uh, five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Some of these saints that came up were their purpose in coming up here in verse fifty-two of Matthew twenty-seven is to be a witness of the resurrection. Okay, they are testimony; they're testifying rather to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is not the Old Testament resurrection that is described in Ezekiel, okay? Because there is a resurrection of Old Testament saints, and they come up at the end of the tribulation period along with the tribulation so saints. Like a, another, another, another correct, there. correct. So if you look at verse 53, the Bible says, And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. What were they doing there? What were they saying when they appeared? They were testifying to something. And Paul gives you a little glimpse into what that testimony is. It's a testimony of the resurrection. They had to die again. Okay? They did not come up in glorified bodies. If they came up in glorified bodies, then they, would, they wouldn't die again. They'd still be here right now. And they're not. Okay. So the Lord put all the good I'm sure by that time the dust and everything else and stuff, so he just pulled them all together. He pulled he pulled five hundred of them up based on what Paul is saying. And if you put Paul with this right here, he put five hundred of them there. 
to testify of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, but they had to die again. It's kind of like Lazarus when Jesus rose him from the dead. Well, Lazarus had to die again, folks. He didn't get a glorified body. He died again. The glorified body thing does not come until the rapture. And the dead in Christ that you read about... Let me see my note here on this. Hold on just a minute. Let me give you some more insight on this first. All right, there's the ninth hour. I'm glad I brought this over. All right. Um, 52. Yeah, I got that note. Okay. All right. Go to, um, let me find it. Thessalonians. Let's go to Thessalonians first. Thessalonians, and we're going to look down here at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to go down here to verse 13. The Bible says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. I connect you over there to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now let me draw you something up here on this thing here for a minute so you can get a picture of it. That's the rapture of the church. All right, you got Old Testament saints, right? All right, you got that group. That's a group of people right there. All right, you got... The church, the bride of Christ, the bride, all right, I didn't spell that right, B-I-D-E, there we go, the bride, all right, that's another group. Then you got the tribulation saints, all right, out of those three groups, tell me which one of those groups is in Christ? Middle of the church. This group here is in Christ. Right? So they have one type of rapture. Okay? They're in Christ. They come up with a glorified body and they're in Christ Jesus. They're his body, they're his bone, they're his flesh. Old Testament saints are the friends. They're the servants, really. Well, let's just put them as servants. All right, they're the servants. Your tribulation saints, guess what they are? They're the guests. That's where you get the uh, ten virgins. Ten virgins. Ten virgins. There are five were foolish and five were. That's right. They're called virgins, they're called servants, they're called guests, they're called this. Remember what John the Baptist said about himself. John's in here, see. What did he say about himself? He's the friend of the bridegroom. He's the friend of the bridegroom. See? And each one of these groups has their own place and how they're going to get resurrected. Now this group here cannot come up with this group here. They have to have a separate resurrection and Ezekiel describes that resurrection. This group over here has a post-tribulation rapture. I know this ain't what. 
This is a post-tribulation rapture here. This here is a pre-tribulation rapture. See, where people get messed up and get all these ideas, they're getting their verses in the Bible right, but they're getting them out of order. So this is a pre-trib rapture. So they got a truth, but it's misplaced. Okay? Once you get the groups situated, there's always going to be three groups. Just like you got Jews, you got Gentiles, and guess what else you got? You got the Church of God. That's three groups. And God did this with this rapture thing here. See? There are seven resurrections in the Bible. Seven of them. They're not all the same. There's a resurrection of the undead, uh, of the dead. That's the people that die without God. They come up and go to the great white throne judgment. This group here that gets resurrected, they go into the millennium. Okay? This group here comes up and they go into the new earth. See? And this group here, guess where they go? New Jerusalem. So when you're reading this here, a lot of people mistakenly read Matthew uh, 27 and think that's, a, that's the Old Testament saints. That's not the Old Testament saints. That's only a small portion of people that come up, but they're not coming up with their glorified body because they have to die again. And Go ahead. So, so basically they're just, uh, their main only purpose was to testify. A temporary resurrection to testify okay. of the resurrection of Christ. A they're a little bit, I don't necessarily agree with it exactly how it's written there. Okay. Uh, I understand where he's coming from on that, but I don't necessarily agree. I've, I've looked at his notes on this before. In fact, I'm looking at them right now. But the thing about it is, when the, when the rapture happens and when the Old Testament saints come up, it doesn't say that part of them come up. It says all of them come up. This says many. Right. And it only says their bodies came. It says, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. It did not say they went to heaven. Just like Lazarus, he rose. But he didn't go to heaven. He had to die again. This group here had to die again. Okay? So that, that's my uh, understanding on that. Okay? Um, maybe you have a different take on it, and that's fine if you do. It ain't, ain't anything to fight on, but I mean, I, that's, the way I, that's the way I understand that verse. These, these saints here are the 500 uh, brethren that so, so came up to testify. To um, that's, these are just connected to the first, first Corinthians uh, uh, 15. Uh, 15, and uh, yeah, I think it's connected to what Paul says about the 500 brethren. Right. The only pl- he, he mentions that like they already know about it. Right. See? Yeah. And if they already know about it and it's recorded somewhere, where's it recorded at? It would have to be Matthew 27. And it says they came up after he rose. See? Okay. See, the Old Testament, go over here to Ephesians now, in case you're questioning me on that. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll show you something else about that. What would be a good study for us to do sometime, and among the other studies we've been doing, is uh, to show all the resurrections and raptures and where they take place, and who, who's, who's going up and when. Uh, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, I believe it is, let's see, maybe I'm in the wrong chapter here, might be chapter 3 here, I'm looking at verse... No, chapter 4. Alright. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all in all. Now let me make something clear on this. When Jesus came up on the third day, 
this group right here were, de- were liberated out of Abraham's bosom and brought to heaven. But their bodies are still in the ground. So I'm not talking about their bo- I'm not talking about their spirit and their soul. I'm talking about their bodies are still in the ground and that requires a resurrection later down the road, which has not happened yet. So their guess, spirits and their souls are in heaven. So their spirit and soul reunite with the bodies. Right, after. at a later time. <laughs> what Jesus did in going down to the heart of the earth is he, got, he emptied Abraham's bosom. He emptied and took this group with him. That's what he went in there and got. But he did not resurrect them physically. Right. See? Don't confuse the two things. That's where people get a little confused. We're talking about two different things. We're not talking about the resurrection of the body. We're talking about the soul when we're talking about Jesus bringing them up as far as getting them out of Abraham's bosom into heaven. When we're talking about their bodies, that's a different story. That's in Ezekiel. Now, you want to see that in Ezekiel? All right. Hold on just a minute. Let me get it for you. And it's going to be Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Now here's their resurrection. When you die, where do you go? Say, people. You people here under the sound of my voice. Where do you go right now when you die? But your body don't. No, it goes to the ground. See what I mean? Always keep that in mind when we're talking about this. Okay. Okay? All right. Ezekiel 37. And we're going to start down here, um, verse 1. Here's the post-tribulation resurrection of the Old Testament Jewish saints. In fact, note has, uh, there's a note on it here. All right, let's read it. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay the news upon you, and will bring, you up, uh, bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, and I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are who? Got it? Not the church. That is not the church's rapture, that's the nation of Israel's rapture. That's when they get their glorified body, their new body. See, when you die right now and you go to heaven, you're incomplete as far as uh, body, soul, spirit. Your, your body's in the ground. You can't have this. Go, go sit down. I need to put you out because my head feels this correct. Yeah. This is where uh, you need to understand your body, your soul, your spirit when they come together, that makes you complete and whole. Okay? But right now, when you die, you're like Casper the ghost. You, 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 you're in heaven, but you're looking around, and you don't see nothing. So if you die right now and go to heaven, and you're looking around, you can't see nothing. There ain't nothing there to see. 
You ain't got a body. You can't see your soul. You can't see your spirit. <laughs> Unless you put a sheet on it. <laughs> I mean, you might see the outline. <laughs> I mean, but... um. But, you know, um, that's why G- why the Lord told those martyrs over there in uh, Revelation, he's, they were up under the altar. He said, you rest for a season until your brethren uh, get slain for the word of God, and then, and then I'm going to make things right at the end, pretty much. And he's going to bring this thing all together at the end by giving everybody the body that it deserves to have. See? So that kind of connects into that. It says there... And it goes on in here. I mean, you can read the whole chapter there. The whole chapter is pretty much on it. The whole chapter is pretty much on that subject. If you want to get some more answers on that, brother. Did that answer your question? Okay. All right, who's got another question? Anybody? Don't leave me up here with no questions now. (laughs) Chuck, are you there? I don't think he's there right now. Did he say anyone? Chuck, are you there? Yes, not. Okay. Anybody else got a question? Well, let's keep reading the chapter then that we were just in. Go down here to verse um, 12. Taylor, you got one? So, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? Mm-hmm. Did he? So, like, it's like an ethical question. Okay. So, he did that, right? Mm-hmm. And would Pharaoh be responsible for, like, what he did afterward, even though God intervened, like, his sin and, like, what he did Mm -hmm. to everyone else? Because he he wasn't responsible for that, technically, because God, like, divine intervention changed him. Uh, So how does that work? All right. The answer to that is found in Romans chapter 1. Get Romans chapter 1 in one hand. And then we're going to go to the verse that he's talking about in Romans. And I want to say it's either Romans 9 or Romans 11. I'll look at it in a minute. First one we want to look at is Romans chapter 1. Verse 18. It always is going to start... To answer your question in a nutshell, man is responsible for his own actions. And as he continues to reject God and reject his counsel, the further away from grace he becomes. So, what starts out as free will, to where you are rejecting God and rejecting what he wants you to do, then God turns you over to something to where you do it and not even realize what you're doing. And God's responsible for turning you over to it, but He's responding to you. See? So let's look at that and see if I'm right. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Watch it. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They've got the truth in their hand. They're holding it, but they're holding it in unrighteousness. They don't believe a word they're reading. But they're holding it. This is the people that come up in your pulpits and wave their Bible around and say, I believe this book from cover to cover, and I believe it's the Word of God. And then they get in a classroom and they open that Bible up and said, a better rendering would be. Or a mistranslation here or a mistranslation there and the King James is wrong here and the King James is wrong and they just go through that thing and mutilate it for you. But they got in the pulpit a few minutes ago to, because of a bunch of suckers that thought they were really Bible believers and waving their Bible around and saying, I believe it. Well, you don't believe it. If you believe it, you practice it. Amen. Amen. Alright, the Bible says here in the next part, because that which may be known of God is manifest and for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Here it is, Taylor. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, 
but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. See, up to this point, they've got free will. They're, in there, they're doing things, but they're doing things contrary to God, the way God created them to be. They're rejecting God and going their own course. And the further away from God they get, the darker it becomes. Now look at the next part. It says, professing themselves to be wise. Here it is. That's the educated crowd. I'm smarter than you. I know more facts than you. I know more things than you. I know all this. I know all that. And you old hit preacher, you don't know nothing. <laughs> they become fools. All right, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, here we go. This is where your question comes in. God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So what God is doing there, Taylor, is he's given them over to the thing that they've already given themselves over to. It's not a thing where the Calvinists say God is giving you over and now he's controlling your thought patterns. It's a thing where God says, all right, if that's the direction you want to go, I'll pull my hand back and let you go. And let you do your own thing. God gave you up to that. And let you respond and let you do what you naturally would do without God. So when Pharaoh's heart was hardened, he hardened his own heart against Moses to start with. And God kept sending him messages. And he kept turning away from the message. So God said, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll draw the line. Pharaoh, you're not going to respond the way I know you ought to respond anyway. And I know, I know the beginning from the end. I know how you're going to respond to the thing in the end to start with. So I'll just harden your heart anyway because that's the course you're taking already. See, And he still holds that man accountable because he rejected the truth of God to start with. And I will give you an example of that in a minute. All right, the Bible says here in the next part, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed uh, forever. Amen. For this cause... God gave them up to vile affections. Even their women changed the natural use. So all this is a response to where they would not take God into their company. Look at verse 28. Even as they did not like to what? Retain God, Retain God in their what? God get, so God's responding to them. That's what he's doing to Pharaoh. Go to Romans uh, chapter... 11, maybe it's 9, let's see, it's right here, it's in chapter 9, alright, the Bible says in verse uh, 17, for the scripture saith that Pharaoh even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now he's again responding to the way the man responded to the message. Now what happens here with Pharaoh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh rejected God's words. Go to Exodus chapter 5. It all goes to how you respond to God's book. That's how God will respond to you. You know, and there's another place in there, I think it's in um, Hosea, where he says, leave, leave, um, leave uh, Ephraim alone, he's joined to his idols. Leave him alone, don't pray for him. Don't do nothing with him. Now, what's God doing there? Is God just one day decide to pick a person and say, don't pray for this one, but pray for this one? No, it ain't like that. It's like this. 
God gave both of them the same opportunity to do right. This one chose to do right. This one chose to do wrong. God sent messengers to this one to get this one back on the right path, and he still refuses to do wrong. So after a while, God cuts his mercy short and says, All right, I'll give you over to whatever it is you want to do. At this point, I'll withdraw my spirit from you, and I'll let you go your own way. And that's basically what that means when it says God hardened his heart. Exodus chapter 5. And look at verses uh, 1 through 9 is where we're going. And after Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? And that's his first response to him. I don't know God. That I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So he rejected the counsel of God right there in number 2. And they said, The God of the Hebrews have met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence and with a sword. The king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? Get you into your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as hither, hitheretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and the tail of the bricks which they did make hereto you shall lay upon them, and you shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore they cry, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let their more work be laid upon the men, that they may labor therein, and let them not regard vain words. So he heard the words of God, and he said, They're vain, and I'm going to make you work harder than you've ever worked, because you're idle. Now, who is who, is who there? Who's responding to who there first? Pharaoh is responding to God, right? And as a result of his response, God then reacts. See, it ain't a thing like, well, I'm going to pick Pharaoh up over here and I'm going to just harden his heart and make him be this bad person in, in front of these people so he's not responsible. He is responsible because when he had the opportunity to do right, he did not do it. There's another example, John chapter 2. John chapter 2, I believe it is. Let's see. Let's see. Hold on just a minute. Let me find it. Just a minute. I want to say it's chapter 2, but it might be chapter 3. Okay, so that's not it. Hold on up. Here we go. It is John chapter 12. Come on, chapter. Here at verses um, 34. Now, this ought to answer the question in more detail on what I was trying to say earlier about Pharaoh, Taylor. So, read this real carefully and notice what happens here. The people answered him, verse 34 We have heard out of the law that Christ abided forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walked in dark, walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may have, be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. Now look at verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet... They believe not on him. Free will. They chose not to believe what they were seeing. They chose not to believe what they were hearing. What happens as a result? That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake. 
Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? So if they continue and persist in that unbelief, here's what happens to them. Therefore, look at verse 39 real carefully. They could not believe. You can get to a place spiritually in your walk where you cannot believe no matter what somebody says to you. You can get to a place where you've hardened your heart so bad. I've met people like that. I have met people, brother, where God has told me not to pray for them. I'm telling you. I've had people like that. I went to go pray for them. Lord, don't do it. Put in my spirit, don't you pray for that person. I've rejected them. You say, well, God don't reject anybody until they die. That's a lie, folks. I'm showing you a place right here where he rejects them while they're alive. Look at this. Verse 39. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said, again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. That's a dangerous place to be, folks. That's why it's always important you keep your heart tender, pure, holy before God, and let God speak to you and respond to Him accordingly. So that you don't become like Pharaoh, so that you won't become like this crowd in John chapter 12, and so you don't become like um, a lot of people out here that keep persisting, saying, I'll do it later. And later never comes. Dangerous. Did I answer your question? Okay. All right, anybody else got a question? Brother Chuck? Uh, huh? When you die, what immediately happens to you? Okay. So, let's go and look at a verse on that. The question is, when you die, what happens to you immediately? Alright, let's go to Philippians. Well, that's where we're going, brother. Hang tight. Hang tight. Got a couple of places I want to show you on that. All right. Uh, get over there to Philippians first. Let's see. Got another place here I want to go to, too. So give me a second here. Sorry, I want you to go first of all, not not Philippians. I want you to go to Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. Let me get this thing where you can. Second Corinthians chapter five. All right. Now let's see what Paul says there. Now we're talking about born again Christians, right? All right. Now, let's look at ver verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest, that means the down payment, of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, watch it brother, right here, knowing that while we are at home, where? We are what? We are absent from the Lord. That's physical. The Lord lives inside of you. So you're not disconnected from him spiritually, but this is referencing a physical connection there. Okay? For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's currently where we're at. But guess what, folks? One day you're going to be in heaven, and you're going to be walking by sight. You know why? Because you're going to see him. <laughs> Adam didn't have to walk by faith when he was in the garden. I mean, God walked in the cool of the day with him. Faith is something that you do when you can't see it. See? 
All right, look at the next thing here. For we are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to what? Be present with the Lord. Be present with the Lord. Now notice that. Be present with the Lord. So the answer to that question, brother, is when you die, you go to be with the Lord. And when you stay in this body, you are here away from the Lord. You do not sleep in the ground. Your body sleeps in the ground. Make that distinction. That's why I always emphasize, are we talking about the body? Are we talking about the soul? Are we talking about the spirit? Your body sleeps when you die. That's why you go down to the casket that looks like a person sleeping there. Okay? But that person ain't in that body. That body is asleep. That person is either in heaven or hell. Now to answer your question like this, go to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, no, Luke 16, excuse me. I'm getting my stuff uh, mixed up here. All right. Luke 16? Yep, Luke 16, 19. This is true both of the New Testament and the Old Testament. I just gave you the one in the New Testament, and I'm going to give you one in the Old Testament. Here's the Old Testament answer, brother. Uh, chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died. Alright, he's dead. Verse 22. What happens to him when he died? He was carried in Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom. He's carried somewhere. The rich man also died and was buried. And where did he wind up? Look at verse 23. In hell. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So even in the Old Testament they didn't sleep. Soul sleep. They went somewhere. You notice over there in the Old Testament when these uh, patriarchs died and stuff, it says that they were buried with their fathers and they won't put nowhere near their bodies. They, were buried, they, they went to be with their fathers, you know, uh, I go to be with my fathers, you know, that kind of thing. They're referencing that place right there, Abraham's bosom, you know. Uh, we're going to be buried with our fathers and whatever, you know. Um, I'm trying to figure how the wording is on that. Let me see if I can find it and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Does that answer your question, Brother Chuck? Yes. Yeah. Alright. Um, you know that they don't sleep also because when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew, who appeared to him? Moses and Mm-hmm. Yep. And they were in their physical body because they were recognized. Yep, that's right. So they've been dead hundreds a year before that. But then they God, showed up. And I guess God just put all the dust together and made fire. I mean, I mean that's what a lot of people think. Um, you know, I mean, they're you, you're going to have to make. That's the biggest problem. I used to try to believe in that stuff. I used to. I, I got it with a group one time that was kind of involved in that. So I, I kind of followed that for a little bit and. But there was too many holes in it. Yeah. I didn't stay in that long because I said, there's just too much here that tells me that that is not what's happening. Right. You do not sleep in the grave. Right. You, you, you go somewhere. And when you go, your body stays in one place and your soul and your spirit go somewhere else. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I'm just looking for it right here. I don't see it. I'll have to find it later. Um, here we go. First Kings chapter 14. 31. Maybe that's one of them. Let me see. First Kings 14. 31. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. 14, 31. Yeah. 
This is kind of an example. Rehoboam is buried with his fathers. Now notice this. Verse 31. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Now, in this case here, it's, it's referring to a physical location. But I want you to, when you're going back through your Bible, and I make notes on it in mine, going through the Old Testament, sometimes it'll say that, and they're not buried anywhere near their fathers. But yet it says they went to be with their fathers. And it uses it like that. They went to be with their fathers. Now, if it says they went to be with them, that means there's a location where those fathers are that are conscious and alive. And that's not all. When Jesus Christ said he's the God of the living and not the dead, remember that? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. I was in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 31. Chapter 14? 14, I was just making a point there about how that's worded there. It's referring to a physical location. But there are other places in the Old Testament where that term is used and they're not buried in the location of their fathers. That's what I was, I was just using as an example. Alright. Now, when Jesus said... He's not the. Uh, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the what? See that? That means somebody's alive in His presence. They're not sleeping. It's only referring to the body. And the verse that I'm talking about, if you want to go look at it real quick, is. Let's see. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Matthew, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 12, verse 27. Mark 12, 37. Mark chapter 12. Verse 27. Verse 24. Jesus is addressing the situation where a man had seven wives. And the question was, whose wife is, uh, sh who, whose, whose husband is uh, going to be whose wife and all that stuff. And uh, Jesus responded to that. And in verse 24, he says this. And Jesus answering said to them, Do you not therefore err you do you do ye not therefore err because ye know not the scriptures? See that chastisement right there? God's gonna get you for not knowing the scriptures. Neither the power of God, for when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. They're alive somewhere. And when people die lost, they die dead. Dead as a doornail. That's why when you read in Revelation 20, it says the dead stood before God. Nobody alive. Different resurrection, different judgment, different location. Anybody else got a question? Yes, sir. What about uh, when you die and you choose to get cremated? Mm -hmm. What about it? Is there anything wrong with that? Uh, I think we discussed this before in another thing, but yeah, um, I think cremation is a personal choice. Um, I don't have any scripture that condemns it. Uh, I do have some scriptures that show that they did practice it some in the Bible, where they burned them. Um, cremation is something that God really don't say yay or nay on it. I, I've never seen anywhere where people were burned in the Bible 
where God spoke up and said, hey, don't do that. That's correct. That's that's a spiritual kingdom, though. It's going to turn to dust anyway. But, I mean, we're not even, you know, they're talking about the grave busting over the rapture. Uh That's not going to happen with the rapture of the church. The the rapture of the church is going to be a situation where God's going to give you a new, glorified, resurrected body. And it doesn't say that the graves are going to burst open. So the dead, the dead in Christ will rise first. Correct. So those dead, when they die, they go to be with the Lord. That's right. But they still got to get a glorified body at some point. Yeah. They don't have that right now. They'll get that when they when they when they go to be with the Lord, right? No. They they are still waiting on their glorified body. That you know that by looking at Revelation. If you get your glorified body at death, then there would be no purpose for the rapture. What is the rapture? It's a catching away. It's a catching up. It would only be for those that are alive, not those that are dead. And I'll show you a couple of places on that, brother, so you can see what I'm talking about on that. Go down here to Revelation chapter 6 and look at verse 9. Alright, in verse 9 he says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the what? Not the bodies. If they have a glorified body at their death, then it wouldn't say souls here. It would say bodies. But it's still the same principle. Whether it's the church age or the tribulation, when a person dies, they die. So when they go to be somewhere, they're going to go be there regardless. See, in the in verse 9, it says, And when they opened the fifth seal, I saw on the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They hadn't got their glorified bodies yet. The glorified body comes at a rapture or resurrection. The Bible says that when they take on that resurrection, they become as the angels of God. Now go back over here to the verse we were looking at earlier in Thessalonians. They want part of the church. They want part of the church, brother. But what I'm saying is, when a person dies, they die. Now, when you die, where do you go? If you're saved, right? Where does a person uh, that dies goes into trip? Uh -uh. Where does a person go that dies in the tribulation period to say? Where do they go? Where do they go? Where do they go? Where's that altar at? In heaven, right? Okay. So they're going down. They're going up to the same place you're going. That's what my point is. Their 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 souls are there. Their bodies are still here on this earth. Okay. That body that you're living in right now is not the body you're going to have at the resurrection. It's a different body, but it's nevertheless going to be a glorified body. When you die, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, when you die, you're going to go, your body, your soul, your soul and your spirit rather go to God. We're just talking about a safe person for a minute. That body, that physical body's done. It's in the ground. Okay? But at the rapture, whether it's a post-tribulation rapture or a pre-tribulation rapture, a rapture, whichever rapture you're involved in, <laughs> if you're saved in the church age, it's a pre-tribulation rapture. There is a glorified body that God is going to prepare for you and give you that's going to unite back with your soul and your spirit and make you complete again. When you go to be in heaven right now at your death, you are not completed. You're not a body, soul, and spirit at that point. You're just a soul and a spirit. At the resurrection. Right, that's right. At the resurrection. I'll show you that in a minute. Go back to Thessalonians first, and I'll show you that verse over there as the angels of God that you're talking about. First Thessalonians. 
Thessalonians. Yep. First Thessalonians. Just just hang tight when you get there and we'll get this one over here that you were referring to first. Right here. Right, Matthew twenty-two thirty. Right, hold your place down at Thessalonians. Go to Matthew twenty-two thirty. Is that what I said? Okay. Twenty-two thirty. See that, brother? For in the resurrection. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as yet, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read which was spoken? I am the God of, and then he goes into that which we read earlier. But that's at the resurrection. Right now, you're like Casper the ghost in heaven. You're running around with no body. See, that's that's my point. You're you're not completely. There until the resurrection or the rapture. All right, now let's go back to Thessalonians for a minute. Let me show you something, then we've got to close this one out. All right, what was it? Chapter one, uh, chapter 5, is that right? Chapter 5. Uh, the one we read earlier is the one I want to go to. We're talking about the dead in Christ. Oh, it's right here, chapter 4. Now notice this. This is future tense. For I would not have you ignorant. Verse 13. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God do what? Why would he say that if they're already there? He's obviously referring to their bodies. Their glorified bodies. That's going to be reunited with their souls. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. When does that take place brother right there in verse 16? When does the Lord descend from heaven? The rapture of the church. Okay. Well look at what happens after he descends. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and, and the dead in Christ shall rise. Future tense. If they've already risen, then that would make no sense. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Then we which are alive and remain on the ground, shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That does not take place until the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. Well, when do they rise first? The context of verse, this verse here says that when the Lord descends from heaven, this takes place. It does not say that they rise first at their deaths. It says that they rise first when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The resurrection has two things that takes place at the rapture. The dead in Christ come up first, and then we which are alive. So what happens there, brother, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go there. This might help answer your question. I know where you're trying to go with it, and I'm trying to help you understand what he's saying here. The answer to your question is going to be found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. This body has got to be changed. Okay? He's going to change the molecular makeup of this physical body that you're in now, and he's going to change it and morph it into something different. That's what's going to happen. He's going to take what you've got going on right here and he's going to change it. How do I know that? Verse 50. 
Now this I say, uh, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. How does that happen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead, watch it, shall be raised with how? Incorruptible. See, there's somebody dead that's coming up. Incorruptible, and we shall be what? Change. Change. That's future tense, brother. That's not at your death. That's at the rapture. So, For, no, that, no, no, I think that was uh, being cremated. Mm -hmm. Cremation has nothing to do with these verses. Right. You can create, I mean, you take a person that gets eaten by a shark out there, what's going to happen to them? God's going to bring that body. God knows where those parts are. He knows where every, every atom and molecule is, and he's going to bring that thing back together just like it's supposed to be, but he's going to bring it together in a different way. He's going to bring it together as a glorified, resurrected body that's like he is. See? You're going to go through a dress rehearsal, and you're going to get a change. <laughs> you're going to get a change like you've never had before. It's not going to be like you've got right now, brother. You ain't even going to look the same. Yeah, that's right. We're going to be like Christ. We'll be flesh and bone. You know what he said to the disciples? He said, handle me. A spirit hath not what? Flesh and bone. What was missing? Blood. That's why he says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and bone can do. Or else Jesus couldn't have got to heaven and come back. Okay, but it's a different type of flesh. And if you read the uh, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, the whole chapter, he talks about that flesh and the different types of flesh and the different types of bodies and how that thing comes together. And it's a mystery, brother. He he makes that statement at the very beginning. He said, "I show you a mystery." In other words, I ain't gonna be able to explain everything about it. I just know this is how it's gonna happen. One minute you're gonna be one way, and another minute you're gonna be something different. See? And those that had their bodies laid in the ground, they're going to come up first and reunite with their soul and their spirit in the air, and they're going to reconnect like dominoes, and they're going to, and then they're going to, and then you're going to have the same thing happen to you. It's just the, the difference between you that are alive and you which have died is there's a distance between them and they're coming together. You, it's just going to take place right there in the, in the same place where your body and your spirit and your soul are at. That body's just going to melt away and come back up a different way. I, I think that's how it's going to happen. I think this is going to just fall off like a, like a melting pot and come right back up. You know, it's going to just like that, you know. And it's going to happen so fast, it's going to be blow your mind. And up you go. <laughs> and then you'll be like the angels of God, brother. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna soar. And, that, and that's how that works. All right? And he goes on and on and on about that. That whole chapter kind of explains 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, though, or chapter 4, rather. There's some other places in there, but we won't look at them tonight. All right, did that get everybody tonight? Okay. All right. Well, we got through that. <laughs> All right. All right, well, let's close in prayer. Um, appreciate you coming out tonight.